Okay, uh, what a pleasure. Sterling, thanks for hosting this event. Thank you, Acceleration Consortium, for making it happen. This is really cool. Um, the title of my talk this morning to kick off this hackathon is Discovering Materials Twice as Fast at a Fraction of the Cost Through Bayesian Optimization. Now that phrase, twice as fast at a fraction of the cost, might sound familiar because that was one of the key points in the Materials Genome Initiative, now 13 years old, right, which is crazy. Um, they were essentially saying that we think that if you leverage computational material science and um, including data-driven material science, then we can actually discover materials a heck of a lot faster. And there's been lots now, 13 years on, there's lots of examples where that has proven to be true. I'm gonna show you one right here. In my slide, I'm gonna show you some from our own research. We were interested in finding new super hard materials. And this is something that has been a millennia old, you know, task for humans. We've been trying to find harder materials for a very long time. So it seemed like a suitable thing to see if we can use this approach to just to accelerate it. Now, briefly, I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, 10 second it, but we found DFT data as our training data. Now, DFT data is not hardness, but we found a way to relate it to hardness. And then the we were able to use that to apply hardness or quasi hardness labels to a bunch of known materials where we didn't know their hardness. We could then screen through those, look for the most attractive candidates and actually make them in the lab. And in about six months, we were able to go from not knowing anything about hardness to finding two materials that were in the sort of top 10 of uh, hard, super hard materials ever discovered, which is wild. And it really proves the point that, yeah, this data-driven uh, process can accelerate materials twice as fast at a fraction of the cost. But, and there's a big caveat here, it only works because we had materials data. Data-driven techniques work when you have data, and they don't work very well when you don't have data. And the reality is that, you know, this has led to a pretty big disconnect between what we expect when we take these frequentist machine learning approaches versus the reality. In reality, if you don't have good data or significant or enough data to have that pattern present in the data, then your frequentist model that's looking for patterns in the data is going to fail. And in reality, that's where a lot of material science challenges lie. Like consider this scenario. Let's say you got hired by a company. Your boss says, hey, we've got this brand new fancy 3D printer. We've got these customers and you've got a week to get that system dialed. And then we're going to start using it to print product. So you say, okay, if I look at the parameters that I have available to me, maybe you've got your X offset, your Y offset, the prime delay, the print speed. So just four parameters, not very many. But even those four, if you were to start to try and think about how, how what's the most efficient way to optimize those parameters, it gets really gnarly. The traditional approach would be to do a design of experiment where you might say, I'm gonna pick orthogonal testing points, which allow me to learn the impact of each independent parameter, right? So let's say that you do a really simple scenario, overly simple. You're gonna pick a low value and a high value of each parameter, and you're gonna do three replicates. That already is three times two to the fourth or 48 experiments. And that's just getting started. Why do I say it's just getting started? Because if you pick a low value and a high value, what if the actual best value is somewhere in between? And this is reality, right? Here's an example of you know X offset versus score. It, if you would have just done low or high, you would have missed the best performance in this case. So this is a problem and we can clearly do better than just design of experiments in learning the our design space, right? So what else can we do? This is where we introduce the field of optimization, right? Now the formalization, uh, you, in, in optimization, you always have the so-called objective function F, which is the actual solution space. Now we don't necessarily know that, but we know that it exists over some domain of objective, uh, some domain, right, X. And our goal then is to systematically search through this space such that we end up with the highest uh, value X, so we'll call this uh, X star that gives us the best value of our objective function, okay? Now the catch is that there's lots of ways to do this, right? You can do that just by randomly sampling. In other words, you don't have to know what that objective function even looks like. That F of X can be unknown to you. And you can simply sample new experimental observations randomly if you want until you find one that goes over your target threshold and you're like, okay, that's good enough. Let's take all the parameters and we'll now just simply use them after random sampling. But that's not very efficient. So for example, if this is the your data points, why would you not take advantage of your knowledge from your previous data point that it was quite high when selecting your next one, right? That, that, that's one observation. The other problem is that it's also not very, it can get derailed by noise in your data. For example, let's say you find this new data point and it goes above your target threshold. Was that noise? Was that repeatable? Um, so this isn't very good. Random sampling, while it technically could be a Bayesian approach, is not going to be a very good one. And so therefore, what we really need is a surrogate model. 
So surrogate model shown as the black line here in this sort of cartoon is not the same thing as the objective function, which is the dashed blue line. It is wrong, right? You can see where it's getting it wrong over here. But the point is that even though it's getting it wrong, it's still useful, right? And even better, you can update your surrogate model as you collect more data. So let's say initially you have no idea what the objective function looks like. So your surrogate model is just a flat line. And then you collect a couple data points and you're like, okay, maybe this is one potential solution for the surrogate model to learn the objective function. And then you collect more data, you're like, nope, that wasn't right. Maybe this is a better one. This process of being able to update our beliefs is the entire basis of Bayesian statistics. And we're here talking about Bayesian optimization. So Bayes, right, he was he's an interesting guy. He was actually a preacher. He wrote two books, one on religion and one on statistics. Um, and he's the father of this Bayesian or probabilistic machine learning approach. And it can written, be written out mathematically at the bottom of this equation, which is the so-called Bayes you know, rule or, or the, the Bayes theorem. And it essentially tells you um, the probability of finding in your distribution certain criteria. It's based off of what we call conditional probabilities. So you start out with a prior, which is, in other words, what you believe about your distribution phi with parameters x, right? So you have phi conditioned on x. And then you're going to multiply that by the probability. We call this the likelihood of some observation y given the constraints, right? Given the condition that you have x and phi as your prior, right? This allows us to then end up with a posterior belief about what our distribution looks like now having observed this observation at point y. If that's really mathy and hard to get your head around, I, I think it's easier to see graphically. You, think, you thought you had an understanding of the prior distribution that looked like this ahead of time. You thought the, the distribution of your uh, design space looked like this. So then you say, what then is the likelihood of a new observation shown as red here, given what I thought I knew about my distribution, and then when you actually make that observation, you end up with a new posterior distribution in light of both your prior and your new data sets. Okay? The catch is that there is now uncertainty to consider. Um, imagine that you're trying to build a bridge on timely, right? Given what happened yesterday. If you have two options to choose from, material A and material B, you might assume, you know, which is better? Probably B. B has a higher average strength than A. But what if it's not just the average or the mean strength, but it's rather the distribution of strength for that material? What if A, even though it's slightly lower, has a tighter distribution, whereas B, while it on average is higher, has a broader distribution? Maybe the, the failure criteria would be down over here, and the likelihood of finding a A material that fails over here is quite low. That's a low likelihood, but it's actually significant for B. In other words, we, we can't just ignore uncertainty in material science. We know that we need to incorporate it. And so we need tools that when we're building our surrogate model, allow us to incorporate uncertainty. And there's many to choose from, but the most popular bar none is gonna be Gaussian process. Gaussian process allows us to sample um, many possible solutions from a Gaussian distribution of our solutions. Um, and because you sample many of them, we end up with many possible uh, solutions. That's where we get our uncertainty from is by sampling many possible solutions. And then when you make observations, you simply force those solutions to converge onto those points, right? So there's lots of possible solutions giving this, this big blue band of uncertainty. And then you have a couple fixed points where now we have observations which force our models to go through those. And this is allowing us to introduce uncertainty. So the catch is, uh, what do you do next? How do you know which sample point to have next? You only started with three here. Where would you look next if you're trying to explore your solution space? Well, you've got options, right? And the most common way to frame this is in terms of exploration versus exploitation. If, for example, you're trying to maximize this function, then what you might say is, well, I've got, of, of these three data points, this on the right was my highest. So therefore, maybe I'm gonna find other high performing points in the vicinity of that one. That's what we call exploitation. You're exploiting your former knowledge about the system to pick something in that region. Or maybe you prefer to say, okay, that was good, but look at these big bands of uh, uncertainty or, right, that we have out here. Maybe this is where we ought to be looking because maybe it's gonna be our next winner. So that would be exploration. So to, to explore this trade-off between exploration and exploitation, we enter the acquisition function, which is really just the tool that we're going to use to tell us where to look next in this optimization process. And there's a gazillion different activation functions you could use. You know, here's upper confidence bound, which uses the mean and the, the upper value of the uncertainty. 
Um, there's expected improvement, which does it in a kind of similar way. And there's many, many others that you could choose from. In other words, <laughs> in the optimization process, the optimization process itself requires optimization. You have to pick which surrogate model to use, which acquisition function, and how about this one, which data points you start with, right? Because the data that you start with is, could be very helpful to help you converge faster to the best possible solution. And you could do a grid search, like it's shown on the left here, that's sort of our design of experiment. Or you could sample randomly for your starting data points, or you can rely on these quasi-random sequences, which really give us the best of both worlds in you know between grid and random. Um, so here's what the building blocks look like then for Bayesian optimization, sort of a, as a checkpoint in our understanding. You have to figure out what's your criteria of success, right? What is it you're trying to do? You then start out with a data pool to get your initial data set. Now you've got this data pool. You then build a surrogate model, which is trying to learn the objective function. Essentially, you're training the model on your data. You then use your acquisition function to tell you which data point to collect next. You get that data by doing some sort of experimental observation, add it to your data pool, and you repeat this process asking yourself, have I met my termination criteria, which maybe means you run out of you know, experimental budget, maybe you run out of time, or maybe you already hit the, the threshold, which you said it's good enough, and then you move on. That, in, an, in a nutshell, is Bayesian optimization. Now, it gets a little bit trickier because we rarely have a single objective that we're trying to optimize against. We usually have multiple objectives. Let's go back to our you know, bridge material example. We, yes, want to maximize strength, but not at any cost. We want to minimize cost and maximize strength. So how do we combine these? And in other words, another way of asking this optimization problem is, how much are you willing to spend for an increase in strength? This gets a little bit tricky, and there's different ways to do it. One way is scalarization, and this simply means you take your two objectives and you turn them into one objective. So you now have this score metric where you have lambda times the strength score, so you want that high, and then plus one minus lambda times your cost score, you want that low, right? You could do more complicated equations if you wanted. Um, and this sort of works, but it assumes that you know the right weighting of your two parameters and that there's a single weighting. But in reality, a better way to think about this is in terms of a Pareto front, which allows you to take your different parameters that you care about. In this case, since we're trying to maximize strength and minimize cost, we're, we're trying to head to this upper left-hand corner. And what you see are these purple points, which are the materials, uh, the, the solutions that exist on the so-called Pareto front. These are the non-dominated solutions, the best ones. And then you've got these gray data points, which are everything else, the ones that aren't better than the ones that are the purple data points. And obviously, I'm showing you here in two dimensions, but we could extend this to higher dimensions um, pretty easily. OK, so how do, why are we here today? At this hackathon, there's clearly some great tools in our toolbox to implement this. There's things like Axe. We're going to hear about that in a moment. There's Bowtorch, Dragonfly, Baby. There's great stuff to uh, to use. And there's really great problems to work on. I'm, I'm thrilled to see there's like 400 people registered for this event, dozens of projects to work on. Um, and so I think the time is right for us to improve the methodology, use existing methodologies for interesting problems, uh, challenge what it can't do and find ways to overcome those limitations. And I hope those are some, some of the things that we do uh, in this event. So with that, I'll stop and take some questions.